guest reached a career high of 33 on the WTA Tour in 2022 and reached the quarterfinals in both Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. She has collected several big wins over many top players and currently can be seen featured in the Netflix docu-series called Breakpoint. She was born in Croatia, plays under the Australian flag, and currently calls Florida home. With a big smile, awesome on-court personality, she's a fierce competitor, yet friends with basically everyone on tour and in the tennis world. Plus, she's one of those players that you probably just know her by her first name. And that might be because her last name is hard to pronounce. <laughs> Welcome to Talk Tennis, Isla Temjanovic. <laughs> I know I messed that up. I'm notorious for messing up last names. I apologize. Oh, no. I like that you didn't even try. I prefer... <laughs> I, well, literally, I just call you Isla, you know. Yeah. Everyone knows who you are, Isla. <laughs> yeah, and I, you pronounce it well. The worst is when they they still, like, read the J. Oh, yeah. <laughs> silent so yeah as long as they get the first name I don't care about the rest <laughs> I had Croatian teammates um when I played college tennis so I hopefully like so slowly started get the pronunciation correct but uh, that helped. yeah anyways how's how's the knee how's everything going with your rehab it's good um you know it's a process but everything since surgery has gone well uh I'm improving I think daily but you know you just gotta you gotta be patient and that's not my strongest suit but I'm just glad that, you know, the surgery went well and now it's just about putting in the work in the gym. Yes, definitely. Well, we're thinking good thoughts and we're missing you already on tour, but thankfully we got to watch you on Breakpoint. <laughs> um, I, I just feel like you're one of those players that you give so much personality and it's so fun to watch you, whether you're on or off the court. So I wanted to kind of start at the beginning. You come from a family of athletes. Your dad played pro handball and you were born in Croatia. Your sister plays. Tell me how tennis started for you. Yeah, I came from a very sporty family. So if it wasn't tennis, it for sure would have been something else. And I know that when my parents met, actually, my mom was a tennis player and she didn't play professionally just, uh, you know, for fun. And she she stopped quite early because she had just some medical issues. But then when she met my dad, like my dad was a professional handball player and he fell in love with tennis when he met my mom. So they would play all the time when he had breaks and stuff. And my sister is two years older. So when she was born, I was like, I was like the kid that no one really cared about because I was two years younger. And <laughs> in that early, in those early ages, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So my sister was kind of the one that they were, you know, teaching tennis first. And I was just in the background waiting for my turn. And by the time her practice was over, they were like tired. So we would leave, you know, and we don't have these tapes anymore. But like, I saw the, where you know, I was waiting for my turn and then my mom just goes, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Let's go. <laughs> and I was like, well, what about me? And they were like, oh, Eileen, we'll do it another time. So I was like watching that and I'm like, I became the pro and you guys didn't even care. <laughs> like, you know, so I really had to fight my way to show them that I really want to do this for real. And just having a sister that did it first kind of helped me you know, you imitate your sibling, especially when you're the younger one. So I think with my sister, I mean, they were kind of learning. And with me, then, you know, I showed them the way more than what she did. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, writing notes on outline before this. And I remember during COVID, you, you and your sister did so many fun lives. And I absolutely just like love your relationship with your sister. And I have a younger sister. And it reminds me a lot of like how my sister and I are now as adults, even. And so she was like a really solid player. She played at University of Virginia, if I'm not mis mis mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Did she ever consider going pro? Did you guys ever like play together? Uh, we actually played early on, like when we were 13, she was 15. I think is when she started to realize that she wants to go to college. Uh, she loved tennis. She loved competing, but she didn't have that discipline. And she loved other stuff too, like, you know, being a regular kid and not missing out on that part of life. So going to college and, you know, having a scholarship, which is so amazing here in the States, it was her dream to do that. And the fact that she had a balance of still playing, but also partying and, you know, just having a normal social life yeah. and developing, having an education and all that. So she, for her, that was perfect. And, and what more can you want than, you know, your education is paid with a scholarship and you get to do what you love. So, um, till that, I would say till she was 13, you know, she was doing, I would say the same schedule as me. And then she showed that she's just not, she doesn't want to do the pro life. Yeah. That makes sense. How often do you guys get to hang out now? 
Um, I would say, well, she moved to Miami, which is oh, great. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking for a place there too. So I think we're going to be closer once I do that. But pretty much whenever I come back from tournaments, she will make her way to Boca or I go down to Miami to spend more time when I have time off. So we, we really prioritize that relationship. I don't know, since we've gotten a little bit older, um, you, we just morphed into best friends where, you know, maybe when we were younger, there was more of an age gap, but Mm -hmm. I don't know. Now it's like, um, yeah, we're, we, we love the same things and we just have the best time together. I love that. That's so cute. And before I get into gear, I have to ask about crews because I'm also a dog lover. And I think like there are so many WTA players that have the best dogs on tour. So tell me about Cruz. Oh, Cruz is the best. He's going to be eight soon, which like breaks my heart. I see like all these grays around his face and I get so sad, but he's the best. Actually, my sister got him and it was supposed to be her dog. And after like a month, she sent him back and she was like, I need to focus on classes. Can you guys take care of him? So he very quickly became the family dog. And I mean, we he brightens up our day, but I will say my mom takes the most care of him because when I'm traveling, I can't do much. So I have the best of both worlds. I just play with him and <laughs> enjoy his company, but I don't do the dirty work sometimes. But um, yeah, it's just so nice to just have a dog in the house. I don't know. I, love I know. It. They're the best. They are the best. So that's awesome. I love it. More cruise content for 2023. <laughs> for sure. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about gear. Our listeners love to geek out on tennis gear. And we know that you have been playing with Wilson for a long time and specifically the Ultra Racket. Um, you recently posted the cutest picture of, I don't know how old you were, maybe you can tell us, of you little, little Isla with your big red Wilson tennis bag. So start telling me how long you've been playing with Wilson and then we'll go from there. So like my first, first racket, which is the one that you don't, I don't even know if you can call it a racket that your parents <laughs> give you. I don't know what that was, but I vividly remember begging my parents for Christmas um, to get me a Wilson racket because all my favorite players, that's mm-hmm. what I saw on TV. Yeah. And, you know, the iconic red bag was what I wanted. And I remember I got it for Christmas, but I only got one. And I, I didn't say this at the time, but I was thinking, what am I going to do with one racket? Like, <laughs> I was a seven-year-old, but still I was thinking, what if I break a string? Like, I need to take care of it. And I took care of that racket. Like, it was like my, you know, the big, like the, my greatest possession ever. And the fact that I I mean, I've played all my career with Wilson is just such a full circle moment. And I, I mean, I truly wouldn't be able to imagine myself with any other brand. I love that. And then this new ultra cosmetic is absolutely gorgeous. Like the racket looks so pretty and elegant. And I know that sounds silly and superficial, but. Oh, it's not. It's okay. very important. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that ultra 100 V4 that you're playing with and why it works so well for your game. Um, The Ultra is just my jam because it's the perfect balance of, I don't like rackets that are too heavy. So I like easy power and something that's, you know, I use the Luxlon and gut. So it's just, I feel like I can do, um, I can play aggressively, but also not go wild. So I don't, it's kind of easier on my shoulder. And after having shoulder surgery, it's just the perfect combo. But when we say cosmetics don't matter, like, oh, they matter. (laughs) Right? Yeah, I know. And whenever we get a new like paint job, I get so excited because it's just it's like a new outfit. I mean, it's literally like the racket at this point, is just an extension to my to my arm. So it's very important. (laughs) I totally agree. And these ones look amazing. I actually have to admit, I love all the new Wilson Cosmetics that pro staff that's coming out. That's like the goal. Oh, they're all so pretty. So um, definitely. And you mentioned your strings. Are you one of those players that's super particular about your setup or you pretty laid back when it comes to setup? Uh, Are you talking about strings or everything? Everything. Okay. Well, I'm not super like, for example, stringing my rackets. Like I won't change my rackets at like new balls and stuff only if I really feel it. Uh, I let my coach deal with, you know, dropping them off and everything. But one thing I'm super particular about is gripping my rackets. I hate like so many times we'll be in a rush and my coach is like, oh, like I'll do it for you. And I'm like, no, they like because I have this thing. I don't think anyone it's just not going to feel right. And I it's not like I have a system. I sometimes do it differently every time. It's a lot by feel, but just knowing that I've done it and it's just, I, that's the one thing I cannot go on court on if I know someone else gripped it. Um, 
there's another thing, and I'm not super proud of this, but I'm not a fan of others, people touching my racket. Like, <laughs> I get I just, it. <laughs> I don't know. And and I felt really rude one time when someone just picked it up and, and my face was almost like, oh my God. And it was, it was a friendly person. It wasn't anyone that, you know, was, wasn't, I didn't know. I knew them, but they were just like, and started, and I was just like, I didn't know how to say it. And I didn't say anything. <laughs> so even when they ask, like, can I, can I see it? And I'm always, I always say yes, because I just feel so rude to say no, but secretly I'm, I hate it. <laughs> I totally so, like, get that. The that only makes person sense. I'm going to tell off is my dad. If he like grabs and wants to go play, I'm like, do not touch my racket. So I always have one in my bag. That's like, if he wants to play, <laughs> he can have it. Um, <laughs> other than that, I think I'm, I'm pretty normal. Okay. And then I assume you probably keep your strings at a certain tension, but then all like, will adjust depending on the weather or how's that go for you? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not super picky. Like when I come back from trips, I will use all my rackets in practice mm. that like were strung maybe even two weeks ago. And, mm -hmm. and even if they're flying on me a little bit, I will never kind of blame the string, I guess, unless it's like a really bad day. Yeah. Um, so I'm not super picky there. For tournaments, I mean, I'm always going to adjust and practice if like, you know, there's altitude or or the balls are different. Just depends on how the courts are playing and the conditions. But overall, I'm not I think I'm a normal amount of picky because I've seen some players and I don't <laughs> I don't go in that category. OK, good to know. Yeah, some people are crazy. <laughs> Actual <Yeah>. crazy. <laughs> um, let's talk about a few more of your endorsements. You are wearing Penguin apparel and it looks so cool. It's so unique. Tell me about that partnership. Yeah, I love my Penguin stuff. We um, we started our partnership. We're in the second year. So 2023, we started beginning of 2022. And, you know, I didn't know much about the brand. And when I like started, when we started talking about it, I started researching. I was like, oh my gosh, this brand has been along for a long, around for a long time. And then I realized it was mostly for men. So that's, I was like, well, that makes sense why I didn't know so much. And I just love that they are branching out to women's apparel and especially tennis, uh, because I do love their style. Like there's, it's very classy brand with a touch of spunk and just, cool designs. And I think that really kind of represents me perfectly because I love to have that classy, but a little bit of edge look. And um, yeah, I love all of my outfits and I'm big on um, streetwear. So I love, I love, I wear Penguin pr basically all the time, unless I'm going out for dinner. And I love partnering up with a brand like that, where I can literally live in it, even outside of tennis. That's amazing. And then another brand that I saw this debut when it came out, and then I saw you wearing it, and I was like, ah, the Amorpho. The Where did you see it first? Um, so what's that website? Carbon 38. Oh, yeah. And like, it looks so cool. And I was like, what? There's weighted vests, but they're like, cool. And then like, literally the week later, you were like, shown in the photos wearing it. And I'm like, no way. That's awesome. No, Amorpho is... And like my favorite thing out there just because it's so unique. And when we first started talking, I was like not understanding what this was mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, it's weighted apparel. You know, you use it for workouts, but then it's stylish. And, it, and I'm like, and I love that it's designed by women for women. That's like a big thing because once I got it, I was like, okay, now I understand. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in the gym and I've used vests in like weighted vests in training and they were always smelly dirty they were <laughs> too big they were bulky they were not comfortable and I hated like putting it on and off my hair would be a mess and when Omorpha came out it was like it fits like a glove um I mean you can literally do any workout you want obviously as long as you're not you know using too much weight and you get injured but if you're smart about it I mean you can get so much more out of yourself just by wearing pieces of clothing and yeah there's just nothing out there like that in it and it looks cool and I can't tell you how many times I've gone to like Whole Foods and people are like want to like touch it <laughs> yeah like, like they're like oh I don't want to be weird but what is that <laughs> like yeah it's a morpho <laughs> that's awesome I love it I'm like into the ball of bands so like that stuff that's kind of still like stylish and functional yeah. and yeah that's amazing um and then shoes you're wearing Wilson shoes right yes uh do you prefer the rush pros or the chaos or you do you but wear both <laughs> 
Um, I've been wearing both. Okay, that's um, what I thought. Yeah, I like the style of um, the pros because I like the longer, like, um, what do you call it? Um, like the, it almost looks like a sock. Oh, yeah. To your sock. Um, but yeah, I mean, they both fit me really well. And I think I need to like make a choice when I get back to playing and because I can't keep switching, but I've, I've used both of them. And yeah, I just, for me, I love when shoes are stable, but light, not that it's going to make a difference, but I don't know. I don't like feeling that there's some bulk on my feet and because I have big feet. So I mean, no, it's, I'm not going to ask, but I do too. So (laughs) So for me, like the width is important, like shoes that Mm -hmm. don't give me pain, like because I have like not to get too into it, but they're just big. So I need (laughs) something that's like hugging them, but not making them uncomfortable. (laughs) Totally makes sense. And you want something that like looks nice that when you look down, you don't feel like a giant in giant shoes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Looks are so important without sounding vain. (laughs) Well, that's a great segue. Um, You debuted in Australian Vogue this year. Talk to me about that experience. Oh, that was crazy. I, um, I mean, I never thought I would, that would ever happen in my life. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was ever something I thought about, but when the opportunity came around, I was kind of kept asking my agent, I was like, are you sure we're doing this? Like you're not (laughs) pulling my leg. And I, I think I even wrote that in my caption and it's so true. Like even when I did the shoot, I was like, okay, until it comes out, I'm not getting my hopes up, but it was such a fun experience because I love fashion and I enjoy, I mean, tennis is my whole life. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how many hours I spent on court and how many hours I've done this kind of work, it's not even, you can't put in the same category. So when I have a chance to do this, I really enjoy it. It's so different. It gets my mind off of things and I like seeing at the finished product. So that was, I'm not going to lie, I was very nervous (laughs) because I'm not a model. So to do all that, I was like, oh, I hope you understand this is a tennis player doing this. Well, you fooled us because you looked absolutely amazing. And well, like... that was the goal. The goal was that you guys are fooled. <laughs> and then also that's like what I'm saying is all the players that reposted and were so proud of you and thought you looked so amazing. That's so cool to have like your peers just support you. Yeah, it's uh, there's a big stigma on the women's tour that we all hate each other. And <laughs> that's definitely not the case. Um But then again, there's so many of us, of course, you're not going to vibe with everyone. I mean, that's just impossible. Um, So people like to just attract, they they like to cling more to the negative stuff than the good things that happen. And I can say, um, I found some of my, you know, closest friends on tour and not a lot, but, you know, a few. And I think that's precious, especially when you're a little bit older, you um, filter out more than you when you're 20. So I've you know, I've gone from being friends with too many people to like having my group. And that's okay, too, because at the end of the day, you have to spend time with who you're the happiest with and comfortable. And I'm just happy that I have a pretty good relationship with most of the girls on tour with a few of my favorites. Nice. Okay, I'm going to move on to preparing for matches. But before we go there, I want to ask if you have any like fun splurges in the fashion world that you've Ugh. made and are you a bad girl because I am like about to go buy I have a big birthday coming up and I'm about to big buy a nice Louis Vuitton bag so oh. I'm are you a, are you a bad bad gal so I used to pride myself on being like not be not a bad girl and uh-huh. now now it's a problem <laughs> I yeah. get it I get it yeah. do you have any like um, fun splurges um, my l- latest one was I bought this Yves Saint Laurent bag because I needed a bag I'm really into small ones the mini ones and I love now and then I needed like a medium one if I go to the city and I have to put more stuff in so I bought this like large Yves Saint Laurent it's black so it goes with everything but oh my gosh um, <laughs> like retail therapy is a real thing 100%. And, and it's a problem right now because like whenever I'm just watching tv I just go on my apps and I'm like what what's out there <laughs> um but I don't I don't think I go too crazy. I always have kind of a rule when I'm dressing or buying stuff. I I go with some of my favorite designs and then everything else is pretty simple. Nice. Nice. OK, so let's talk a little bit about preparing for matches. Maybe you can give us some advice. So we've got listeners that are competing at all levels. Um are you someone that likes to look ahead at the draw or do you take it match by match? Do you have any superstitions in that way? You know, I used to not care at all. Like before, I mean, I would look at the whole draw. I would be happy to see all the popcorn matches. 
and I don't know when this switch happened where now I, my coach just tells me who I play. And then I'll always ask him like about, you know, my friends, who do they play just to know. And I'll, then I'll check the schedule when it comes out. Cause that way I don't know the draw, but yeah, I don't know when this happened. And it's a problem because sometimes you accidentally find out, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> You're like, and it messes tell me. with my head now. Yeah. Now it, cause I will start thinking about it, but Overall, I mean, that's the only thing that I'm really cautious of not doing is just not looking who I play. Okay. So people, yeah, it's just, it helps me to like detach from the future. That makes sense. And um, I've already mentioned that I'm a big fan of watching you. And I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, in the last year or two, there seems to be um, a more emotional, mature response out on the court. And is this something you've been putting a lot of time and working on? Or is it something that you just feel like you've continued to like get older so you have more experience? Talk to me about how you're kind of like embracing your stronger mental side of the game. Yeah, I think that I've been doing this for a while. And I I had a moment maybe a couple years ago where I felt like I've been through so many heartbreaking matches that I've lost. And I felt like I was finding myself in these situations again and again, and not much was changing. You know, the emotions would always get the better of me in the end. And I'm the type of person I want to win so much. Like it means so much that it has the counter effect sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think there came a point where I just was like, okay, I need to really dive deep into what goes wrong in these matches when I lose and just not try to minimize that same outcome for the next match. And when I started doing that, it just, every match that I played, there was something different than that didn't work. So I was always, I started problem solving a lot more and just, it's not easy to confront your negative sides. It's scary. It's, we all kind of run from that when, when you have to talk things, not badly of yourself, but just acknowledge that, well, I screwed up here. And why did I do that? Why was that a thought, thought that came in my mind at five all and 30 all? Right. Um, but confronting it and going over it, just helped me to relax more. And the more I kind of worked on it, the more the more success I had and then built confidence. And before I would just kind of cry about it, be sad and 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 just not want to confront it because it's too painful. So yeah, it was time. Well and I guess that's what I also wanted to say is I feel like you're showing up more confidently on the court and we love that. Um <laughs> so that is showing and I was gonna ask, are you kind of like a mirror message kind of gal or like do you have any kind of mantras that you remind yourself of or are you just continuing to like be in the moment and playing each point as it comes wait did you say mirror are you talking about like quotes when you wake <laughs> yeah. up yeah um well I have this thing that's been helping me lately is I read it somewhere I forgot now where but it's about being like imagining because I'm such a kid at heart mm -hmm. like I'm gonna be I don't even want to say the number but I don't feel my age same <laughs> and someone I was watching this podcast and they were like would you the things you think about yourself or the things you say about yourself in your worst moments would you say that to your like seven-year-old self and now I was like god no so I actually have um my a picture of myself as my screensaver when I was like a kid oh my oh there's so, this picture like, yes. the one I posted and it just helps me and I have it like in my room. So I don't know, whenever I glance at it, it reminds me of that thought and thinking like that. And, and it's helped me a lot because you'll never talk down to a, that kid, you know, and why would you then to yourself now? So that's helped me a lot in just my life in general. But on the court, I it's just been a lot of experience that's come into play and, and things clicking together. And I guess just not panicking, you know, I... Mm -hmm. I know what to do and it might not go my way, but as long as I do the things I have to, there's no need to panic because it's already probably a tight moment. If I add my panic to it, it's going to become even bigger. So just staying present and not thinking that it's bigger than it really is. Nice. That's good advice. Now, you were a big part of Breakpoint and Netflix had cameras like literally in your guys' faces all the time. Tell me about how that was and was it like added pressure? Did you kind of forget that they were there or like how was that experience? Who uh, Breakpoint was very fun to film overall. I think in the beginning I didn't know what to expect so I was very nervous of how it would be and then you know I thought what if you don't have I don't know that moment that people will like and then maybe your story is going to be not fun or it won't be interesting 
And then the when we got to like halfway, we were just before Wimby, I was thinking, no matter if you, I don't know, win a slam or something, your story still has a lot of weight to it. And, and it's cool. It's And it's yours. Every Every single person out there is different in their own way. And I think and that when I started thinking that way, I was always just enjoying to film and, and be a, as natural as you can be, because obviously having a camera in your face is not natural, <laughs> right. but you do forget about it, especially in those key moments that I think people will want to see, like when just before a match or after a match, because you're not, the last thing you're thinking is about a camera. I'm thinking about how do I win where right. I'm going like on that court. So I think the more we did it, it was just more fun. And if you see my team, like they're joking all the time. So it's hard to keep a straight face, but I just enjoyed the process because I think it's cool to capture these moments that usually, you know, no one's going to film you like that. So I I'm excited to see the other five episodes. Me too. I binged it in like one weekend, which I thought a lot of people were saying before it came out that it wasn't really for the tennis fanatics or the tennis Mm -hmm. players. And I watched it. I was like, I love this. I I, oh, good. Yeah, I thought it gave such great insight to everyone's personalities and like players that I've already thought are amazing. Now there's even more reasons why I think you guys are awesome. So I think you guys did oh, amazing. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap this up. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. Um, <laughs> let's see. Okay, this is like a heavier question, but go for it. <laughs> I like to get deep. What legacy do you want to leave behind? Oh, I don't know if I will. Legacy is such a big word. I mean, you know, when I started this, I never thought about anything like that. But now that I'm a little bit more mature, I do appreciate the fan base I do have. And it's if I inspired one kid to pick up a racket and say, oh, my gosh, I want to be like her. That's more than enough. And I think what describes me best is that you can be yourself and embrace who you truly are and be really good in your sport or just w- whatever your best is become that because i during my career like you said break point you know i was always told you got to be more mean or or more like just i guess be more of a bitch <laughs> and at times that didn't come natural to me because i have this competitive side but i also have this just i don't know my personality not to say that i'm really nice but i'm just not Like there's two contrasts and sometimes I would tap in more into the one than the other. And I think I've gotten just good at separating those two. And it took me a little bit of time, but whenever I tried to be more mean and tough, it never really worked because it wasn't natural. So um, I would say that staying true to yourself and just trying hard at your, you know, your passion and whatever your dreams are is, is going to take you a long way if you, if you stay true to that. I love that. And then is there anything that you would want people to know about you that you don't think they know about you? What would they not know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, and that's like, maybe there's not a lot because you actually do an amazing job of like balancing an authentic voice, but still being like professional. And it's, it's cool because we've gotten to see you did that my tennis life with tennis channel. And like, we've gotten to see behind the scenes and like on court and you're a fierce competitor and like you're you're just when you're winning and even when you're losing and then your speech is after it's just so great I think you just draw people in with that so we we appreciate that yeah I mean I always get like they're always like oh my gosh Isla you always look so stoic and almost like you don't have emotion and I kind of hate that because inside I mean in every aspect of my life I'm I'm very emotional. Like I, mm-hmm. I love to get happy. I, when I feel things, I really feel them deeply, mm-hmm. good and bad. And I think it's more my strength than my weakness because I don't know, it's just things matter to me, you know? And I think people sometimes don't get that side because on the court for those two hours, I'm trying my best just to keep calm. And, and I have a good poker face most yeah. of the time, but there's a lot going under there. So um, yeah, I think fans that have, maybe been around longer than maybe now since just last year can really see that. But yeah, I just, I love, I love to feel things. Things matter. So yeah. Yeah. I'm very emotional too. So I get it. (laughs) Um, And last but not least, this is a little cliche, but what advice do you have for aspiring players, especially for the young ladies, let's say seven-year-old girl out there that's playing and has her big red Wilson bag. What advice do you have for those up and comers? 
Ooh, those little ones. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah. Um, it's funny. For those little ones, I just want to say, don't be afraid to dream big, even if it's scary, because so many things can be done if you love what you do and pretty much just live, truly live it, you know, and, and do your best daily. But the thing that I wish I embraced more when I was a kid was not being so tough on myself. Um, it's going to save you a lot of a lot of gray hairs in the future. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not a sprint. It's definitely a marathon. It's a long career. You have, you're going to have so many opportunities um, as long as you learn from each mistake you make and you really celebrate your wins. Yeah. Nice. That's a perfect advice and so good to end on. Isla, thank you for joining. We wish you all the best in 2023. We can't wait to see you back on the court. Can't wait to see you back in Breakpoint. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>